Analic Cobb, and I'm standing in the music room at Hashman's Park, and we have here 50 keyboard instruments that I've collected over the past uh, 53 years, I think. They include 18 instruments that belong to or were played by very famous composers like Haydn, Beethoven, Purcell, Chopin. That's a very special group and it's the largest group of that kind actually to be seen in one place anywhere in the world. Today we're looking at this really beautiful specimen of English harpsichord building uh, of the 18th century. It's by Jacob Kirkman and his partner Abraham and was built in 1781. This was a beautiful instrument and it's got the very unusual feature of these drawers, the original, uh, built in to presumably hold music. It's the only instrument I know of that has this particular feature. It's a sort of elegant harpsichord cum chest of drawers. Uh, this drawer particularly is very strange shape, but very effective. This is actually our latest acquisition, this harpsichord. It's a very high quality object. The veneer at the front of the instrument is very wonderfully figured. Um, inside it has the rose you would expect from Kirkman uh, gilded um, metal rose. And um, generally it's a very smart object. Kirkman was one of the two great makers of the 18th century. He dominated London harpsichord building along with uh, Bakat Shudi. Uh, Shudi made harpsichords for the Prince of Wales, Kirkman for the King. The sound of his harpsichord is the epitome of English 18th century sound, such as known by Handel, Boyce, Green, Arne. And of course, the harpsichord was chiefly played by ladies. Queen Charlotte continued to use Kirkman throughout um, her life and later on would swap for a new, in order to get a new Kirkman, she traded in a wonderful Rooker's harpsichord, which is in the V&A. He had such a dominant uh, position over, over the trade in London. There's a charming story that he was worried by uh, a rising fashion in English guitars or sitoms uh, amongst ladies ladies started playing guitars instead of harpsichords. Uh, I know my own ancestor, Lady Betty Cobb, bought one in 1758 and her daughter is seen playing it in a miniature of later in the 18th century. Kirkman's response was to buy lots of English citizens and give them to disreputable ladies of the street so that it became a bad thing and the fashion certainly waned. Uh, towards the end of the 18th century, so it may well be true. He was very canny. He, he, he trained under Hermann Tabel, um, a Fleming who made harpsichords in London, was a very good maker. Schudi also trained under him uh, slightly before. But when Tabel died, Kirkman was his chief guy, and he promptly married Tabel's widow, uh, and thereby gained a wonderful workshop, lots of seasoned woods and all the materials of his trade. Um, it was sadly a childless marriage, but his, his business passed on to his nephew, Abraham. The concert we're going to hear on this is our it's christening concert in Hatchlands, um, given by Douay Hesbury, Thomas Allery and Mary Janet Leith, um, who've entitled the collection of pieces they've gathered together as there goes London's musical Coleman. Uh, I will leave it to them to explain the significance of their title. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And it's such a treat for us to be here this afternoon, this afternoon, and a special treat in this very strange world to actually be sharing some live music with you. So thank you for coming, and we feel really privileged to be here. And it's a special treat today because um, we're going to be playing on this um, 1781 Kirkman harpsichord, and this is actually the latest acquisition of the Cobb collection, and this is its first um, sort of 
main concert that it's been using, so it's a special treat. And today we're going to take you into the world of London, London musicians in the early 1700s. Um, so we're going to be looking through the eyes of Thomas Britton, who was a coal seller, um, who was a very musical coal seller, who used to run musical evenings in his coal loft in Clerkenwell, to, to which all the good, the great and the good of London used to attend, climbing up the small stairs. Um, so this was around sort of 1670s onwards. Um, so our concert programme includes performers who we know performed in the uh, coal loft itself, um, and also um, composers who were in the catalogue um, of uh, Britain's music, which was preserved on his death. And so we have lots of different options to bring this coal loft to life. Um, so our first composer is Godfrey Finger, uh, perhaps familiar to any of you who played the recorder. Um, he came to London in his early 20s, I think, and then um, had a very successful career in London theatres. He left London very suddenly because he entered a musical competition and lost, and was so embarrassed and humiliated that he left, and, uh, left for Germany and never, never to return. Um, so we have a sonata, a very short sonata, by Finger. <laughs> Britain, 
when equipped in his blue surplice, his shoulder laden with his wooden tinder, and his measure twisted into the mouth of his sack, was as much distinguished as he walked the streets as if he had been a nobleman in disguise. And everyone that knew him pointed as he passed, crying, There goes the famous small Coleman, who was a lover of learning, a performer of music, and a companion for gentlemen. So he was quite a character. And um, he attracted many different characters to his coal loft. And the next two pieces kind of work as a pair. Um, it's a prelude by Papush and then a chicane by Handel. And the Papush um, prelude sort of act as a little exposition into the Handel chicane. Um, both Papush and Handel worked together at Cannons, at that great musical establishment there. And we're going to be playing two pieces today which come from the division flute. Um, this is the first one. That was a collection um, which was adapted from Playford's division violin.
today um, quite frequently in the coal loft with Thomas Britton. And it was, of course, before 1714 when uh, he was still composing keyboard works. And so we can imagine he might have played that chacon sitting there um, surrounded by all sorts of people in the evening. It must have been pretty fun. Um, and of course, this was a, a time when all sorts of people were arriving in London, and particularly Italians. I'm sure um, there would have been several Italian musicians joining in um, in the coal loft. So we've included two today, a sonata by Sabatini, um, Sabatini, one of two brothers, the other of whom stayed in Italy, um, but Sabatini of London was a fantastic oboe player who put all the English oboe players to shame when he arrived. Um, and then we have a lovely arrangement of two Scots songs by Gimignani, um, again, a fantastic performer himself on the violin, but loved Scottish music. He thought it was the highest style, the highest possible taste. Um, and so he, he made several arrangements in his um, treatise in the art of music. Um, so first, this is some teeny sonata.
coal lot was located in Clerkenwell, so just outside of the um, city walls. And at the, well, including it um, the present day, the city churches of London had um, a very important role to play as musical establishments. And of course, there were even more than there are now, pretty much around every single street corner. And our next two composers were both um, city organists of churches, but were also very important composers of the period. Um, first of all, William Babel, who was the organist of a church called All Hallows Bread Street, which is actually no longer there. I think it was destroyed in the Second World War. It's just um, to the um, west end, the east end of St Paul's Cathedral. And Babel was well known um, as an arranger. He wrote many arrangements of well-known operatic arias for the harpsichord solo. And they are very elaborate, and they kind of give us a clue as to the sort of ornamentation and decoration that players might have done at the time. And we're going to play um, a concerto by the bell, and we thought that would be nice in today's programme, because included in Britain's very extensive music library, there was actually, um, it says here, a collection of 12 concertos by Dr. Papush, young Mr. Babel, and Vivaldi. And these would have been the sort of concertos um, that would have been played in the intervals um, in theatres. And then I'm going to follow that with a short harpsichord solo piece by a composer called Philip Hart, um, who's mainly known for a collection of organ fugues and voluntaries. Um, and he was the organist of the Church of St Michael's at Cornhill, which is still there today. So I hope you enjoy these two pieces, both by city organists.
before we play our last couple of pieces, um, a huge thank you again for joining us today. It's been a real joy for us to be here. And um, we were originally meant to be coming with the other two members of, of our ensemble, um, with Magda and Florence, our cellist and violinist. Um, and we're going to be coming back next year, um, all being well with, with the current situation. So we'd be lovely to see you again um, with, with the four of us. And we've actually brought with us a couple of CDs, or yes. with DVDs, which um, is something that we've only just released, so it's pretty much hot off the press. And it's a part of a project, you heard a little hint of it there with the Giuliani um, uh, two settings of Scots tunes. Um, we've been playing uh, last year quite a lot of Scottish Baroque music, some real sort of undiscovered gems there. And we were lucky enough to be able to do a project with a Highland dancer who was actually dancing to some of the um, music that we were playing from that period and from that school. And we've made a DVD which has her dancing and us playing as a sort of live concert. And those are available afterwards. I think they're, they're going to be on the, on the way out. So obviously we'll be making sure that people can get out safely, but they, those will be for sale at the end. They'll be available. Um, brilliant. And similarly, we usually have a mailing list you can sign up to, but do just Google us and you will be able to sign up on our website. Um, so our last two um, pieces. Uh, we have a division flute um, variations by John Bannister. Um, John Bannister, there were two. The father was in fact the first person to hold public concerts in London, full stop, as far as we know, um, in the 1670s. But he died, um, and his son kind of kept on the musical tradition. Um, and he, the son, was attending at Britain's concerts. Um, and he was actually a violinist, playing with the uh, 24 violins, the equivalent of the French um, version. And um, this is just really a fun piece. Um, very rosatory, um, very, very fun. You can imagine a good atmosphere um, for this one. And then the last sonata we're playing is by Pezzabal, um, a French composer, um, but again, spent a lot of time in London, became a virtuoso recorder player and performed in the intervals on stage, which was very unusual, um, and was paid a great deal of money for playing concertos and sonatas of his own composition in between the acts. Um, unfortunately, his sonatas remain unpublished. Um, this is possibly because they are hard. Um, <laughs> they are quite strange. Um, the rhythms are quite sort of, you know, unexpected often, but they're absolutely brilliant. Um, so we're going to play one of those today um, and do watch out for the last movement. <laughs> 